The Canal de Midi, considered by many to be France's premier canal, flows for over 240 kilometers through the gently rolling countryside of the Languedoc. And from its western terminus in the port de l'Embouchure in the city of Toulouse, the canal climbs steadily through the farmlands of the Lauragais Plain to arrive at Ocean Lock and the start of the summit level at the Col de Nerouz. At the eastern end of the summit pound, Mediterranean Lock marks the start of a descent that lowers the canal over 190 meters to the shores of the Mediterranean. After dropping down to the Grand Basin in Castle Nodri, the canal passes below the fairy tale fortress of La City in Carcassonne, and then enters the sun-drenched countryside of the Minervois, an area noted for its fine wines, ruined castles, and sleepy villages that have barely changed in the last 200 years. On the outskirts of Béziers, the magnificent staircase lock at Fonzeran lowers craft down to the river Orb, dropping over 13 metres in a single flight. And then, after passing through the round lock in Agd, with its unusual layout of three pairs of gates, the canal opens out into the broad expanse of the Etang de Tau. Finally, after travelling over 240 kilometres and navigating through over 60 locks, the Canal du Midi arrives at its eastern terminus in the port of Set on the Mediterranean. Plans for joining the Atlantic and Mediterranean had existed for many years, but it was not until Pierre-Paul Riquet, a salt tax collector from Béziers, solved the problem of providing a reliable source of water to feed a canal, that construction of a waterway could finally begin. During his travels through the Languedoc, Riquet observed that waters arriving at the Col de Nerouz flowed both to the east and to the west, making the site an ideal location for a summit pound. He set about constructing a large reservoir at saint Ferriol, high in the Monte Noir, together with a system of feeder channels that would carry the diverted water down to Nerouz. This system is still in use today and Pierre Paul Riquet is acknowledged as being the father of the Canal du Midi. During the busiest summer months, opening times are sometimes extended to 8 p.m. While in winter, locks may only open on demand, and it should be noted that locks close for an hour at lunchtime. In December and January, many of the pounds are drained for essential maintenance work and it's advisable to check with the Navigation Authority for planned stoppages. If you intend hiring a boat on the waterway, formalities are kept to a minimum. At the boatyard, you'll receive a briefing on your chosen craft and a short-term carte de plaisance will be issued. For UK citizens cruising in their own craft, the situation is more complicated. French regulations require that anyone in charge of a vessel must hold an appropriate licence. Currently, the Navigation Authority recognises the RYA's International Certificate of Competence incorporating a test of 70 rules as being valid for craft of up to 24 meters. Boats longer than this require a category PP certificate and at present the authorities do not recognize any UK qualification. The certificate can only be obtained by sitting an examination in France. You are also required to carry your boat's original registration documents as photocopies are not acceptable proof of at least third-party insurance cover, a boat and operator's license if VHF radio is fitted to the vessel, and finally a valid passport is required for everyone on board.
The Canal de Midi's western terminus is found here at the Port de l'Embouchure in the city of Toulouse. A busy motorway borders the port and most visitors tend to see quieter moorings further along the canal. Three waterways open out into the port at the east end of the basin. The right-hand arch leads to the Canal de Brienne, which used to allow craft access to the Garonne River, just above the Bazartal Weir. And although now closed to navigation, it still acts as an important feeder channel for the Canal Lateral à la Garonne. The centre arch marking the entrance to the Canal du Midi and the right-hand arch that leads to the Canal de Brienne make up Le Pont Jumeau, the twin bridges. And a large marble bas-relief has been erected between them. Designed by François Lucas in 1775, the frieze consists of allegorical figures that symbolise the coming together of the Atlantic and Mediterranean seas. The remaining left-hand arch marks the entrance to the Canal Lateral à la Garonne and completes a through route from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. For larger vessels entering the Port de l'Embouchure from the Canal Lateral, the turn into the Canal de Midi can be quite tight and many craft find it easier to turn around in the basin before entering the canal. This centre arch marks the start of over 240 kilometres of gentle cruising that will carry the Canal de Midi down to the shores of the Mediterranean. And for the first eight kilometres, the waterway cuts its way through the noisy suburbs of Toulouse. From its very start, the banks are lined with plane trees that have been planted for practically the whole length of the system. And as you journey eastward, the trees provide welcome shade. This city section used to contain four locks, but the Ecluse de Matabeo has been removed, and during a modernization program, Bayard Lock, with its unusual approach of concrete girders, was converted from a double to a single chamber. This new, electrically operated lock is over six meters deep, and floating bollards have been installed in the walls to make mooring easier. These changes to Bayard and other locks along the system may not be reflected in some older guidebooks and a certain amount of confusion can exist regarding the number of chambers to be found at some locks. Overlooking Bayard Lock is a statue dedicated to the life and works of Pierre Paul Riquet, although it's somewhat ironic that the statue is surrounded by motor vehicles and that Riquet has his back turned on the waterway. The Navigation Authority recommends that visiting craft intending to spend some time in Toulouse moor at Port saint sauveur This area offers quieter surroundings than Port L'Embouchure and the city centre is only a short taxi ride away. Just around the corner from the port is the Cathedral of saint Etienne. The building combines the Gothic styles of the Midi and the North and it is here that a marble plaque commemorates Riquet's last resting place. Toulouse is known as the Pink City. This is due to the colour of its many red brick buildings and if time permits it's well worth stopping for a little while to explore its many churches, museums and parks. At the heart of the city is the Place de Capitole, which is surrounded by pink arch walkways crammed with shops and boutiques. And it is here in the many pavement cafes and restaurants that the local Toulouseon come to watch and to be seen. 
The imposing Capitol building dominates the square. Its facade was designed by Guillem Camus in 1750, and its eight marble columns are said to represent the city's first aldermen, or Capitouls. Today the building plays a multi-purpose role, as it houses the municipal opera, an art gallery, and city hall. Just behind the Capitol is the fortress-like tower of Le Donjon. The building was restored by Violet Le Duc in the 19th century and used to contain the city archive, but now houses a tourist information centre. Just a few minutes walk away is the Basilica of saint Senar with its 65-metre-high octagonal tower dominating the skyline. The basilica, named after the Christian martyr San Satina, is the largest Romanesque church in Western Europe. It's built in a cruciform style and boasts a five-aisle nave, together with nine chapels. The remains of several saints are laid to rest in the large crypt, and a tour of these relics proves very popular with pilgrims travelling south to Spain. As the canal leaves the city, it winds its way through the science district and soon arrives at Port Sud on the outskirts of Ramenville. The purpose-built marina complex houses shops and apartments, together with full boating facilities, including a slipway, fuel and showers. After 12 kilometres of lock-free cruising, the suburbs give way to open fields, and at Castanet we encounter the first of the oval-shaped locks that are so characteristic of the Midi. We now enter the gently rolling countryside of the Lauragay Plain. Today the area is mainly given over to cereal production, but in the 16th century the Lauragay contributed greatly to the wealth of Toulouse by producing blue pastel, or dyer's woad. Many services along this section are situated some distance away from the canal, but at Montgiscard Lock, moorings are available just a few minutes walk away from the sleepy hilltop village, and here you can find all the basic amenities and the first real opportunity of replenishing supplies since leaving Toulouse. The village also boasts a fine example of a Gothic church with a typical Toulouse-style bell tower. Just after a Guivlock, the canal crosses one of the many aqueducts that were built to overcome the problem of severe winter flooding. And the distinctive red Toulouse brick is still very much in evidence along this section, as far up as the summit level. Cycling is a national pastime in France, and the towpath between Toulouse and Port Lauriguet has been tarmacked to provide a pleasant cycleway. When mooring, boaters should be wary of cyclists travelling along the towpath at quite substantial speeds. There are a total of 15 locks between Toulouse and the Summit Pound, and at the Ecluse de Sanglier, the double chambers raise the canal over three and a half metres as it continues to climb steadily towards Nerouz. When the canal opened in 1681, the first barges to travel the waterway were bow-holed by gangs of men. By the middle of the 18th century, horse-drawn craft had taken over, and packet boats carrying mail and passengers would ply the canal from Toulouse to Set, the journey taking about four days. Initially, passengers would disembark and change boats at the more congested locks, but later the same craft would be used for the whole trip, and when night travel was introduced, the journey time was reduced to about 36 hours.
Negra Lock used to be one of the old packet boat staging posts. An inn provided accommodation for the passengers, while the horses were housed in stables for the night. A small chapel was built alongside the inn to cater for the passengers' spiritual needs, and services are still occasionally held here. Other staging posts along the route included Castle Notary, Carcassonne and Le Samai. Just after Negra Lock, the canal crosses another aqueduct, and it is here that we find the higher base of Locoboat Plaisance. The distinctive design of their penny chette is based on old working boats, and the company offers the facility of one-way cruising to Argen on the Canal Lateral, together with Argen Minervois on the Midi. The entrance to Gardouche Lock is probably one of the most aesthetically pleasing to be found anywhere on the canal. Short-term moorings are available at the quayside just above the lock gates, and basic amenities can be found in the village which is just a short walk away. Shore facilities now become rather limited until reaching Castle Nodery, and it's advisable to stock up with supplies either in Gard Douche or the larger town of Villefranche de Lauragais, which is situated about two kilometres to the north of the canal. At the remote Emberel lock, it's possible to leave the waterway and visit the small town of Avignonier. It was here in 1242 that Carthar horsemen from the fortress of Montségur in the Pyrenees attacked two members of the Holy Inquisition. The inquisitors were murdered and their files destroyed and in reprisal Catholic forces took Montségur and its inhabitants were burnt at the stake. Shortly after Emberell Lock, we arrive at the purpose-built marina of Port Lorigay, that incongruously shares its facilities with the Autoroute service area. The harbour offers pleasant moorings that are sufficiently far away from the noisy motorway, and the complex houses a restaurant and gift shop, together with a museum dedicated to the canal and its architect, Pierre Paul Riquet. Entry to the museum is free of charge and it's well worth a visit for anyone interested in the history of the canal and its creator. A second museum, La Overly, has been built on the far side of the port. This museum is dedicated to the very popular local sport of rugby union. After leaving Port Lorigay, the canal crosses under the motorway and two kilometres later completes its journey up to the summit level at the Col de Nerouz, where at a height of 190 metres above sea level, Ocean Lock marks the start of the summit pound. For devotees of the canal and its creator, this is probably one of the most important sites along the waterway for it is here at Nerouz that the streams of the Montaigne Noir enter the canal, providing it with a constant supply of water. Riquet had observed that Nerouz was a natural watershed and the ideal place to site a summit level. So he set about creating a series of feeder channels that would flow from the mountains in the north down to Nerouz. The feeder system begins here at the Pré de Alzo, high up in the mountains of the Montaigne Noire, where a sluice gate diverts water from the river into the Rigol de la Montagne, a purpose-built channel that contours the hillside like a giant gutter. Over 2,000 labourers were employed in excavating the channel, 
and at the same time Rique started work on the construction of a large dam at reservoir at San Ferriol in the Lodo Valley. Initially the Rigol de la Montagne flowed into the headwaters of the River Saw, but in 1686 the military engineer Marshal Vauban extended the channel by a further seven kilometers to San Ferriol. In order to combat water seepage some sections of the new conduit were lined with terracotta tiles that are still in use today. Extending the channel involved piercing the Camas Ridge with a 120 meter long tunnel. Monumental portals were built at each end with as much detail going into the aesthetic properties of the tunnel as its practical design. At the time of their construction, the dam and reservoir at San Ferriol were the greatest civil engineering works of their kind anywhere in Europe. The dam, built on a bed of granite, is 780 meters wide at its crest and rises to a height of 32 meters above the valley floor. The reservoir has a capacity of 180 million gallons and the lake provides the area with a huge recreational amenity. The local community has erected a plaque alongside the dam to celebrate the achievements of Pierre Paul Riquet. The area below the reservoir has been landscaped with waterfalls, footpaths and forest trails. And the natural head of water pressure that the dam produces has been used to create a spectacular fountain that sends a curtain of spray 15 meters into the air. Even with a reservoir the size of San Ferriol supplying water to the canal, it still suffered from water shortages during the summer months and would have to close for periods of up to eight weeks. In 1777 a second dam was constructed at Lompy and more recently in 1956 a third dam was built at Le Camas. From San Ferriol, the channel follows the course of the Lodor River down to a set of sluices at Le Tomaz, and before descending to the summit level, combines with another feeder, the Rigol de la Plaine. Rique had planned to build a new town at Nerouz, based around a large hexagonal basin that acted as a reservoir and settling tank for the feeder waters. Unfortunately the basin soon silted up and plans for the town were abandoned with only the Royal Mill remaining today. The remains of the hexagonal basin and its network of small feeder channels can still be seen and it's well worth taking some time to explore the Nauru site before continuing your journey eastwards. Finally, 65 kilometers after entering the Alzo intake, the waters of the Montaigne Noir flow into the Canal du Midi, and two plaques mark this rather inconspicuous junction. The first lists the length of various feeder channels, while the second, erected by the Inland Waterways Association of Great Britain, pays homage to the canal's founder. In 1825 a large obelisk was constructed overlooking the site and it's probably most fitting that Riquet's life and achievements are remembered here at Nauru's. The summit pound is only five kilometers long and the auto route and railway are never far away. Although a raised embankment does offer some protection from the constant traffic noise of the busy motorway. An old wash house, one of several to be found along the waterway, marks the start of the small hamlet of Le Segala, which is situated halfway along the summit pound.
Moorings are available at the quayside, and facilities include drinking water and rubbish disposal, together with a grocery store and small restaurant, the Relay de Rique, that proves to be very popular with both locals and visiting boaters. At the eastern end of the summit pound, Mediterranean Lock marks the start of a descent that lowers the canal through 190 metres to the shores of the Mediterranean. Just below the lock is a small family-run pottery that produces the large earthenware bowls that are used for making the local delicacy, cassoulet. After Mediterranean Lock, the canal descends steadily towards Castelnaudry, dropping 20 metres in a distance of only 5 kilometres. The manually operated locks are close together, with the double-chambered rock lock, followed a few minutes later by the triple-chambered Ecluse de Laurent, proving quite a workout for boat crews. Three kilometres after clearing La Plante Lock, we arrive at Castle Nodery, the first major town since Toulouse. In years gone by, this quayside in the old port would have been full of barges laden with wine and grain, but now only pleasure craft moor here. At the end of the quay, the canal enters the Grand Basin, where the town's houses spill down the hillside to the water's edge. The basin measures 400 metres by 300 and is actually a reservoir built to supply water to the quadruple chambers of San Roche Lock. One of the largest rental operators in France, Crown Blue Line, is based on the south side of the basin and one-way cruising is possible to Port Cassafier on the Canal de Midi and Saint-Gilles on the Canal de Rhône set. Overlooking the port is the collegiate church of Saint-Michel, with its 56 metre high octagonal steeple dominating the skyline. The present building dates back to the 17th century, although a 16th century doorway has been preserved. Castle Nodery can best be described as a functional town that offers a wide range of amenities, including a good selection of shops, banks and supermarkets. The rolling countryside surrounding the town was noted for its grain production, and one landmark worth visiting is the Cougarill windmill. At one time, Castle Nodery supported up to 32 windmills, but now only Cougarill remains. The mill ceased production in 1921, but has since been restored and is open to the public during the summer months. Leaving Castle Nodry, the waters of the Grand Basin empty directly into the staircase lock of San Roche. The electrically operated gates are remotely controlled from a cabin overlooking the lock. And this can be quite disconcerting for boat crews as there is no direct contact with the keeper. The quadruple flight lowers the canal almost nine and a half metres and craft intending to lock through should arrive no later than half an hour before the scheduled closing time. The canal now continues its steady descent towards Carcassonne, dropping a further seven metres here at Vivier Triple Lock, where the difference in water level is used to power one of the last remaining working mills. After clearing Bram Lock, we arrive at the isolated Port de Bram. The port is little more than a small quay and is very reminiscent of the canal harbours found on many Irish waterways.
The old buildings used to provide accommodation and stabling for the packet boats that plied their trade many years ago. And today, Port de Bram is home to the Nichols hire fleet. The company has other bases at Le Semai, Carnan and Bellegarde. The town of Bram is just a 10 minute walk away from the port. At the center of the old town is a 13th century church, surrounded by narrow streets that radiate out in a concentric pattern. The town offers all the basic services, together with a fine local market on Wednesday mornings. After leaving Port de Bram, the canal again shuns civilization for a little while, and the going becomes less strenuous, with only two locks to negotiate in the next 16 kilometers. The hamlet of Villequilonde offers pleasant moorings, but only limited services. Alongside the church in the center of the village is a large elm tree that's reputed to be over 500 years old. After Villequilonde lock, the canal begins to twist and turn sharply for several kilometers with some bends proving quite difficult for larger boats to navigate. Hermony Lock is only 270 meters beyond the double chamber de Clouse de la Lande and effectively creates a triple flight that lowers craft almost 10 meters. Both locks are electrically powered and are controlled by the keeper. After clearing Hermony Lock, we continue towards Carcassonne, which is now less than an hour's cruising time away. Riquet's original canal bypassed the city, as the council had refused to contribute towards its construction. And it wasn't until 1810, when a new five kilometer section was added, the Carcassonne was finally connected to the waterway. The canal enters the city via a deep cut that was excavated by Prussian prisoners of war and then opens out into the port de Plaisance. The port used to service wine and grain barges but today it provides facilities for visiting pleasure craft. Carcassonne is a very popular tourist attraction and in high season it can be quite difficult to find moorings at the basin. Water and electricity points are available along the quay and on arrival visitors should report to the local VNF office where mooring charges are payable. The basin is situated opposite the railway station and a constant stream of traffic makes for rather noisy surroundings. Alternative, and in our opinion better moorings, can be found immediately below the basin at the foot of Carcassonne Lock. The moorings are equipped with water and electricity points and picnic tables have been thoughtfully provided under the welcome shade of some plane trees. The basin's central location makes it an ideal starting point for exploring both the old and newer parts of the city. The main shopping area is found in the lower town, while the stunning medieval fortress of La Cité stands high on a hill overlooking the River Ode, about a ten minute taxi ride away from the port. La Cité is best known as a medieval fortified town although the original settlement dates back to the 6th century BC. Over the years, Romans, Visigoths, Carthars and many more besides have all inhabited the fortress, but its present day appearance is credited to Violet Le Duc, who was the architect behind a government restoration project in 1853. Today, La Cité ranks as one of the most popular tourist attractions in France, 
and during the summer months its narrow streets are packed with visitors. The first fortifications were built on a rocky outcrop overlooking the river road back in the 3rd and 4th centuries, but it wasn't until the 13th century that the present day design was constructed. The defences take the form of two concentric walls separated by areas of vacant ground called lists. The walls comprise of 52 towers together with nearly 3,000 metres of ramparts and in many places overhanging wooden galleries known as hordes have been reconstructed on top of the battlements. This medieval setting has been used as a backdrop to several feature films including Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, starring Kevin Costner. After exploring the fortifications, it's well worth visiting the Basilica of saint Lazare, which harmoniously combines a Romanesque nave and Gothic transept. The church boasts two rose windows that date back to the 13th and 14th centuries, while the organ is generally considered to be one of the oldest in France, with some of its components dating back to the 16th century. Both the lower town and the city have lots to offer, and at least a day should be set aside for exploring the area. As the canal leaves Carcassonne, it contours a steep wooded hillside and after clearing saint jean Lock, enters a delightful avenue of cypress trees that lead to the Fresquel Locks and Aqueduct. The aqueduct carries both the canal and main road high above the river and is immediately followed by the double and single chambers of Fresquel Locks. The chambers are only 105 metres apart and effectively make up a triple flight. The locking procedure is the same as at Sun Roche Lock in Castle Nodry, being remotely controlled from a cabin overlooking the canal. We now enter the department of the Ode and as the canal contours the valley towards Treves, there's a noticeable change in the countryside. The landscape takes on a more Mediterranean feel and the warm climate and light sandy soil provide ideal growing conditions for grapevines and this is very much the start of wine country. While the sandy soil of the Languedoc is ideal for growing vines, it presented the canal builders with a major problem. The soil was so unstable that it would not support the lock walls. But the problem was resolved by building the chambers with curved sides. This design offered much greater stability in the friable soil and today the round-sided locks remain one of the main characteristics of the waterway. The Orbeal Aqueduct announces our arrival in Treb. The small market town offers a good selection of shops and services and visitor moorings with water and electricity points can be found in the somewhat noisy Port de Plaisance, which is situated in the middle of the town. Although many visitors prefer to mourn the quieter avenue of plane trees that lead from the port to Treb Log. Connoisseur cruisers operate a higher fleet from the port, with further bases at Homs, Narbonne and Beaucaire. During peak periods, Treblok can prove quite a bottleneck, with boats sometimes having to wait up to three quarters of an hour before being able to lock through. The higher base in the Port de Plaisance is only 400 metres from the lock, and for novice crews who have just picked up their new boat, the prospect of having to lock down through the triple chambers can seem quite a daunting prospect. 
The whole operation is controlled by an ever-vigilant lockkeeper, and as long as you follow his instructions, the procedure should go smoothly. When locking up, water enters the chamber with great force, and care should be taken not to allow your boat to get too close to the top gates, and a firm hold should be kept on mooring lines at all times. The triple chambers lower the canal almost 8 metres, and this difference in water level was used to power two mills at either end of the flight. Today the top mill has been converted into a restaurant, while at the bottom end of the lock, the lower mill has fallen into disrepair. After leaving Treb Lock, the canal winds its way through a pleasant tree-lined section that offers nine kilometres of lock-free cruising. The hamlet of Marseillette marks the end of the pound and offers the chance to replenish supplies in this otherwise remote stretch. Just above the lock is La Muscadelle restaurant, which is very popular with boat crews. The canal now begins yet another steep descent, with locks rarely more than a few kilometres apart. The Fonfield triple flight followed very closely by the double-chambered Samatar and Aigui locks, lower the canal almost 20 metres in only 3 kilometres. At Aigui lock, keeper Joel Bartes has carved flotsam from the canal into surreal sculptures that decorate the lock side. Some pieces are on permanent display, while others are sold to passing boaters, the proceeds being used to buy flowers to decorate the lock. The canal continues to meander through the vineyards of the Minervois, and at La Redoux, the quay was built to service the wineries that border both banks of the waterway. The wine was stored in large holding tanks and then transferred to barges that would transport their cargo to Narbonne and Set, the journey taking up to 36 hours. Several of the old wine barges have now been converted to plush hotel boats that usually cruise the Midi between Béziers and Carcassonne. These barges normally offer a high standard of accommodation and cuisine for up to 10 passengers, depending on the size of the boat. But this form of luxury cruising does not come cheap, and prices can range from £1,000 to £4,000 per person. Shortly after La Redoux, we arrive at the Argen Doubler Aqueduct, built by Vauban in 1693. The canal and towpath cross high above the Argen Double, while the 11 arches allow excessive flood water to drain into the stream some 15 feet below. We now arrive at the village of Homs, one of the main ports of the Minervois. In years gone by, the quay would have been crammed with barges loaded with barrels of Corbier and Minervois wine. But today, Homs is a popular overnight halt with higher crews, and by late afternoon, the quayside is usually full. Although alternative moorings can be found on the opposite bank in a purpose-built marina. Both sides have electricity and water points, although a small charge is payable for these services. The village offers all the basic amenities and several restaurants and cafes can be found near the quayside. Holmes is ideally situated for cruising the canal in either direction and several hire companies are based in the village. The canal now skirts round the attractive hill of Peche Laurier and while the hotel barge Berendina navigates Peshloria Lock, the passengers stock up on supplies at the Lock Cottage. 
In fact, many of the Middies keepers supplement their income by selling a selection of produce to passing crews. The small village of Vargon Menevois lies just beyond Peche Laurier Lock, with its medieval chateau standing guard over the canal. This area relies heavily on wine production for its economic viability, but today there's an ever-growing emphasis on tourism, and the village boasts one of the largest hire bases to be found on the canal. It's ideally situated as it offers one-way cruising to Negra in the west and Lat to the east. Argent's lock marks the start of Le Grand Beef and the longest canal pound in France, with 54 kilometers of lock-free cruising that stretch all the way to Béziers. As the canal contours the hillside, it passes below the sleepy villages of Rubia and Parazza, and we now enter the valley of the Ripudre, where once again Rike was faced with the problem of how to protect the canal from flash floods. His solution was to build a large stone aqueduct over the river, and today this design is acknowledged by many as being the first of its kind anywhere in the world. Although the Minervoir is still relatively underdeveloped, in the last few years there's been a marked increase in the number of holiday homes being built alongside the canal. These waterside properties in the village of Vontenac are very popular with British visitors. This rather religious looking building is in fact a small museum and wine cooperative that forms part of Chateau Vontenac. Moorings are available right alongside the chateau and the museum is well worth a visit as it tells the story of wine production in the area together with a display of agricultural machinery. Vines have been grown in the Minervois since Roman times and today a selection of fruity whites and full-bodied reds can be purchased at the cooperative for very reasonable prices. Back on the waterway, the ubiquitous plane trees offer welcome shade from the midday sun. But their main function is to help stop surface evaporation and to conserve water supplies. Unfortunately, many of the trees are now very old or diseased and the Navigation Authority has recently announced plans to fell and replace over a third of all the trees along the waterway. The moored boats at the Nittles higher base announce our arrival at the village of Le Semai. The distinctive Pont de Marcel dominates the port, and many believe this small hamlet to be one of the prettiest stopping points on the waterway. The village was built to serve as a port to Narbonne, and was also a staging post for packet boats travelling to Set. Passengers were accommodated in the old ivy-clad inn, while the chapel of St. Peter and Paul, lying alongside the Pont de Marcel, provided spiritual comfort. In its heyday, Le Semai was a busy port with warehouses and stabling, together with an old ice house that can still be seen next to the chapel. Facilities at the port are fairly limited, but the village does support a pottery and art gallery, together with two well-patronised waterside restaurants. One popular attraction is a second-hand bookshop that can be found in an old converted warehouse. 
The store contains over 30,000 books that are mainly in French, although it does offer a small selection of English language titles. The village's location on the Long Pound makes it an ideal cruising base, and the port is home to Minervois Cruisers, the only independently run hire fleet on the waterway. After the construction of the Junction Canal to Narbonne, Le Semai saw a marked decline in commercial traffic, and it's only recently, with the increase in pleasure craft, that the village is returning to more prosperous times. Two kilometres after leaving Le Semai, the canal passes the very popular La Cascade restaurant. and a few minutes later arrives at Port Minervoise and the Cesse Aqueduct. In this otherwise remote stretch, the shop proves very handy for stocking up on supplies, including a selection of locally produced wines. A 3,000 metre long feeder channel carrying much needed water from the river Cesse enters the canal at this point. The Cesse Aqueduct, designed by Sebastian Vauban in 1686, carries the canal high above the river. Throughout the summer months, the waters flow gently towards the Mediterranean, but during the flash floods of winter, the river can become a raging torrent, carrying tree stumps and boulders along with it. The damage this flotsam causes to the three arches of the aqueduct can easily be seen. Just 300 metres after the aqueduct, we arrive at Port Le Rabin. This small marina consists mainly of long-term moorings and facilities include mechanical repairs, a slipway and fuel. Leaving Port Rabin, an avenue of umbrella pines leads to the junction with the Canal de la Rabin. Although the peaceful ambience of this remote area is somewhat spoilt by the constant whine of machinery emanating from a nearby factory. The route down to the sea is made up of two canals. For the first five kilometres, the junction canal lowers the waterway down to the river Ode. And after crossing the river, the Canal de la Rabine drops down through Narbonne to enter the Mediterranean at Port de la Nouvelle. The journey from the Canal du Midi to the River Ode involves a descent of 23 metres through seven locks. In 1995 the locks were automated and are now operated by typing a four-digit number into a control panel. At Ormpea Lock, it's possible to leave the waterway and visit the archaeological museum of Ampharalis. The Gallo-Roman pottery dates back to the 1st century BC and for the next 300 years was producing up to 3,000 amphorae each day. A large roof covers most of the excavations and visitors can view the workings from a suspended walkway. The museum also houses an audiovisual display depicting the life and times of a Roman potter. Back on the water, the canal continues to drop down to the River Ode, and as well as being controlled by electronic keypads, the operational state of the locks along this stretch is indicated by a system of traffic lights. When two red lights are showing, you must come to a halt. Red and green together signify that the lock is being prepared, while a green light indicates that you may proceed. Four hundred metres after clearing saint Coeur lock, we arrive at Salel's Dode. The canal de Junction runs through the middle of this sleepy village, and pleasant moorings can be found just above Salil's lock. 
At a depth of 5.4 meters, the chamber is one of the deepest on the waterway. Like at many of the deeper locks on the Midi, care should be taken when locking down to clear the large sill that sits below the top gates. Facilities in the village include two restaurants together with a boulangerie and supermarket and it's a good idea to stock up here before heading for Narbonne. An avenue of plane trees leads down to the junction with the river Ode at Gaius de Loc, where the buildings resemble a fortress more than a canal cottage. And in a way that's exactly what the Loc is, as it defends the canal from the floodwaters of the Ode. The Loc has the unusual feature of a dry dock built into the side of the chamber, and this facility can be booked in advance at Salel's Dode. Although crossing the Ode isn't that complicated, it does require some care. When entering the river from the junction canal, you must first head upstream for about 20 metres until you pass under a cable hung above the river. At this point, turn back on yourself, keeping as close to the far bank as possible, and proceed towards Musulan's lock. You can only cross the river when conditions are favourable. If the gauge at Gaius de Loc indicates a depth of over 2.5 metres, you may proceed at your own risk, keeping as far away from the weir as possible. If the reading is above 2.7 metres, navigation is forbidden. Mousselin Loc marks the start of the Canal de la Rubine, and after nine kilometers of gentle cruising, we arrive in the city of Narbonne. Narbonne lock is semi-automatic, and the locking procedure is triggered by turning a pole suspended over the canal just before the lock entrance. If you encounter any problems during the automated sequence, the procedure can be stopped at any time by pressing an emergency button that is situated alongside the control cabin. After exiting the chamber, the automated procedure continues by closing the gates and preparing the lock for the next craft. Ahead lies the Pont de Marchand that proves quite an obstacle to navigation as there's just over three metres clearance in the centre of the arch. This restriction prevents many craft from reaching the Med via Narbonne. The Pont de Marchand is in fact an old Roman bridge. Today the bridge is lined with medieval houses that have been incorporated into the fabric of the city. The Narbonnais view the canal as a civil amenity and the large quayside provides pleasant, if somewhat noisy, moorings. Electricity and water points have been provided, and this is a good base for exploring the city. Overlooking the quayside is the award-winning covered market, where you can find supplies of local produce, including meat, vegetables and fresh fish. Founded by the Romans in the 2nd century BC, Narbonne is the oldest town in the southwest of France and at one time was a major port, although it now lies 20 kilometers inland. At the heart of the city is the Cathedral of Saint-Just and the Archbishop's Palace. Today the palace houses the town hall together with an art gallery and archaeological museum. During Roman times, Narbonne was an important crossroads, and a section of the Via Domitia, the old Roman road, has been uncovered in the square. The passage of the anchor forms the entrance to the museum and art gallery. And at the end of the alley, a flight of steps leads to the cathedral cloisters that date back to the late 14th century.
Construction of the cathedral began in 1272, but a succession of problems over the centuries has resulted in the building remaining unfinished to this day. The vaulted roof rises up to a height of 40 meters, and saint Just is known for its alabaster statues and stained glass windows, with some dating back to the 15th century. As the canal leaves the city, it passes close to an out-of-town shopping mall and hypermarket, and then enters a remote rural section that is quite narrow in places. Shortly before Mandarak Lock, we arrive at a local community project that is constructing a replica of the Mary Teresa, one of the last midi barges to be built on the system. After Mandarak Lock, there's a marked change in the landscape as the plane trees begin to disappear, and the canal enters the salt marshes of the Etang de Sijon. This whole area is a vast nature reserve, and egrets and flamingos are quite a common sight in the area. Finally, we arrive at Port La Nouvelle, where this flyover marks the limit of navigation for hire craft, although it should be noted that the beach is still a two kilometer cycle or taxi ride away. The port holds little attraction for tourists, and this is very much an area that you transit through. The commercial docks offer all the usual marine services, including facilities for stepping or unstepping masts. For those seeking sun, sea and sand, the beach at Port La Novelle stretches for over 13 kilometers. The Canal de Robin provides a quick and pleasant shortcut to the Mediterranean, but crews using this route would do well to remember the height restrictions in Nabon. Back at Port La Robin, it's time to continue eastwards along the Canal de Midi and for the first two kilometers, an avenue of umbrella pines and plane trees leads to the town of Argelière. The town's located on a large bend in the canal and provides all the basic services and is an important wine producing center. As the canal leaves Argelière, we find the restaurant of Le Chat Qui Pêche situated in a canal-side cottage. And three kilometers later, the Auberge at La Croisade provides yet another popular eating establishment. For the next two hours, the 16-kilometer section between Argelier and Capstan twists and turns tortuously along the hillside. A very low and narrow bridge guards the entrance to the Port de Plaisance in Capstan, and it's not unheard of for larger vessels to flood their bilges in order to squeeze through. The port overlooks the town and is one of the most popular overnight halts on the waterway. The quayside has been refurbished and water and electricity points have been provided. La Batelier restaurant proves popular with visitors and other restaurants can be found down the hill in the town. This was the site of one of the worst disasters to ever take place on the canal. After severe storms battered the Languedoc in 1766, the water level rose by over three feet and the bank at this point collapsed resulting in millions of gallons of water pouring down the hillside into Capstan. The town and surrounding area is dominated by the imposing collegiate church of Saint Etienne that dates back to the 13th century.
The canal continues to twist and turn high up on the hillside, overlooking the ubiquitous vineyards. And at the 400-year-old Domaine de Guerry, it's possible to visit the wine cellars where the owner will be happy to arrange your own personal tasting. The sleepy village of Poilers borders a large double bend in the canal. The village offers basic services and is well known in the area for its gastronomic restaurant, La Tour Saracine. Shortly after Poilers, we arrive at the Malpass Tunnel, the oldest navigable waterway tunnel in the world. Malpass translates as bad passage and the canal historian L.T.C. Rolt observed that it is remarkable that the western end of the tunnel has survived for so long without lining or support for the rock is so soft and friable that it crumbles to sand at a touch. Riquet's enemies complained to Colbert, the French finance minister, that it would be too expensive and dangerous to build such a tunnel. And Riquet was directed to stop work on the project. But he ignored the order and pushed on with his plans and the 160 meter long tunnel was completed in only six days. Overlooking the tunnel is a steep ridge that bears the remains of the Oppidum de Onzerun, an important center of Mediterranean civilization that dates back to the 5th century BC. This ancient hill fort is only a kilometer's walk away from the canal and is well worth exploring. The site was first excavated in 1915 by the archaeologist Felix Murray. Many subsequent digs have unearthed a vast variety of artifacts that are now on show in Murray's old house. Exhibits include tombstones and relics dating back to over 300 years BC, together with a fine selection of Greek pottery. The Onzerun Ridge provides fine views in all directions and just below its northern flank lies the Gulf of Montedi, an area of marshland that was drained during the 13th century. The drainage ditches radiate out from a central collector, very much like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. As we arrive at Colombier, the canal passes a traditional midi lavoir, or wash house. The village offers all the basic services, while the chateau restaurant proves popular with boaters. Colombier boasts a modern purpose-built marina that is now the home of the higher firm Rive de France. The company has other bases at Lursagala on the Summit Pound and also at Egmort in the Camargue. Just after Colombier, the canal enters a narrow section where mooring is not recommended. And then finally, after 54 kilometers of lock-free cruising, we arrive at the outskirts of Béziers and what must be the most spectacular feature on the waterway the staircase lock at Fonzeran. A total of nine locks used to lower craft down to a crossing point on the river Orb. But today an aqueduct carries craft over the river and the bottom section of the original canal now lies derelict. A one-way system operates on the flight and special attention should be paid to lock times. Commercial craft, such as hotel barges, are normally given priority. Locking through the flight can be quite daunting for novice crews, but the gates and paddles are electronically controlled and the whole procedure is overseen by several lock keepers. While descending the flight is relatively straightforward, locking up can be quite spectacular as the water gushes into the chambers with great force At the bottom of the flight, the lower chamber has three pairs of gates. 
One set leads to the disused arm of the canal, while a second pair are left permanently open and lead to the orb aqueduct. While locking down, there are fine views across the valley towards Béziers and the Cathedral of Saint-Nazaire. In 1983, a large water slope was constructed alongside the Fonzeron flight with the aim of replacing the seven locks. The huge 160-ton traction unit could push a large wedge of water containing several craft to the top of the canal in only six minutes. Unfortunately, the tractor unit has suffered a series of mechanical breakdowns that have rendered it unusable and due to financial restraints, it's now unlikely that the slope will resume operating in the near future. Less than a kilometre after clearing the Fonzeron flight, we arrive at the Orb Aqueduct that carries the waterway high above the river and into the lower town of Béziers. The aqueduct's architectural qualities can best be appreciated when viewed from the river and although it was constructed after Riquet's death, there can be little doubt that he would have considered the aqueduct a worthy addition to his canal. The aqueduct leads into Orb Lock, and during a modernization program in the late 70s, the lock was converted from a double to a single chamber. The uncharacteristic straight sides rise up to over six metres, making it one of the deepest on the Midi. The lock opens directly into the new port. Along the quayside you can find water and electricity points, and here visiting boats jostle for a mooring space with long-term residential craft. Bézier town centre is a 10 minute taxi ride away from the port and on Friday mornings the main street is home to a flower market that attracts many visitors all hoping to snap up a bargain. Pierre Paul Riquet, the grand architect of the Canal du Midi, was born in Béziers and today he is recognized as one of the community's most famous figures. The town ranks as one of the largest in the Languedoc and is the commercial center for the local wine industry. Béziers has a cosmopolitan feel and it's well worth spending a little time here to explore its many delights. At the top of the Allée Riquet is the chocolate box style municipal theatre built in the reign of Louis Philippe. In the old quarter the narrow alleyways are crammed with shops ranging from stylish boutiques to tempting patisseries and around every turn is another tree-lined square with its pavement cafe or restaurant. Standing guard over the valley of the Orb is the 13th century cathedral of Saint-Nazaire. The building replaced an earlier church that was raised to the ground in 1209 by the Catholic forces of Simon de Montfort. Many of the townspeople were supporters of the Cathar religion and so de Montfort lay siege to the town and up to 20,000 inhabitants were slaughtered. No distinction was made between Cathar and Catholic with de Montfort saying Kill them all. God will recognize his own. The present-day cathedral is built in a southern Gothic style and alongside the main building is a 14th century cloister.
The Bishop's Garden provides a peaceful haven from the hustle and bustle of the main streets, while a shaded terrace offers fine views of the lower town back towards Fonzeron Locks. Leaving Bézier, the canal continues to drop gently and the shores of the Mediterranean draw ever nearer. Villeneuve-le-Bézier offers pleasant if noisy moorings in the centre of the town, but most crews tend to take on supplies and then move on. The surrounding countryside is now very flat and boring, and there is very little to interest visitors heading for the coast. After clearing Portheran Lock, the canal enters an area of marshland and begins to run parallel with the coast, and the beaches of the Mediterranean are little more than a kilometre away. Back on the waterway, we pass Paul Cassafier, the purpose-built home of hire company Crown Blue Line. Shortly after Port Cassafier, the canal arrives at the unique structure of the Libron crossing, built to overcome the problems of severe flooding. It's hard to believe that after heavy storms, the normally docile river Libron can turn into a raging torrent and thus preventing passage. A series of counterbalanced pulleys operate a number of guillotine gates that enable sections of the canal to be closed off, which in turn allows the floodwaters to flow either side of passing craft. By alternatively opening and closing the sluices, boats are able to work their way across the swollen river. We now continue through an area of rather uninviting marshland and soon arrive at the port of Agde. Originally a prosperous Greek trading port, the town stands on the site of an extinct volcano, and many of its buildings, including the 12th century Cathedral of saint Etienne, are built of dark volcanic stone. The town provides all the main facilities, and it's well worth exploring the network of narrow streets that lead up from the quayside restaurants. The Canal du Midi passes along the northern edge of the town and just after the Navigation Authority offices in the old toll house, arrives at the famous Round Lock with its unusual layout of three pairs of gates. The lock was built to connect the canal with two different levels of the river Ero. The middle gates allow private craft to drop down into a narrow channel that opens out into the tidal river, just below a large weir. This route enables craft to head downstream past several fishing quays and boatyards, where yachts can step their masts, before entering the Mediterranean at Grodagd. Back at the Round Lock, the third set of gates leads to the River Ero, about 250 metres above the weir. After entering the river, craft should turn left and head upstream for 700 metres before rejoining the Canal de Midi at the Stop Lock, which is normally left open unless the river is in flood. The Ecluse de Bagnas is the last lock on the waterway. It is here that the canal reaches sea level and the salt waters of the Toe Basin lie ahead. The lighthouse at Léon Glou marks the entrance to the Aton de Toe and the end of the Canal du Midi, a journey that has covered 240 kilometers since leaving Toulouse. The lighthouse provides a very important landmark when entering the canal from the lagoon. The Tow Basin is renowned for its shellfish, and craft heading for set should take great care when passing the large mussel and oyster beds. 
If time permits, the small fishing villages that border the lagoon are all worth visiting. The port of Marseillon is very popular with the local boating fraternity and during the summer months the quayside restaurants are packed with diners sampling the local shellfish, washed down with a well-known aperitif that is produced in the town. The Etang de Teau is a broad expanse of water and special attention must be paid to the prevailing weather conditions. Higher craft are not normally allowed to cross the lagoon if the wind is in excess of force 3. The port of Set lies at the eastern end of the Tow Basin and completes the realization of Rique's dream, a waterway joining the Atlantic and Mediterranean seas. Sadly, Rique died just six months before his grand plan was accomplished. When seen from Mount Saint Clair, the entrance to Set Harbour is easy to make out. When viewed from water level, this old warehouse and navigation marker provide the best landmarks. Access to the port is via two lift bridges. Opening times vary and it's best to contact the harbour master's office for up-to-date information. When the bridges are lowered, the maximum clearance is only two and a half metres. Visitor moorings can be found in the Port de la Guerre that marks the limit of navigation for higher craft. Water and electricity points are provided, but with the railway station just across the harbour, these moorings tend to be rather noisy. Set was developed specifically to serve as the eastern terminus of the Canal du Midi. Today, the commercial port is one of the busiest in France and boasts one of the largest fishing fleets on the Mediterranean. The town is interlaced with a network of canals that are packed with small fishing boats and during the summer months water jousting tournaments attract huge crowds to the quaysides. The old port is home to the local trawler fleet and each evening the catch is loaded onto lorries for shipment around France. Although some of the fish ends up just across the road in the many seafood restaurants that line the quays. Before leaving Set, it's worth climbing one of the many footpaths that lead to the top of Mont Saint Clair and the small chapel of Notre Dame de la Salette. At a height of 182 metres, there are fine views over the town and port and back towards the oyster beds of the Etang de Teau. For crews wishing to continue eastwards to the Rhone, this section contains a brief guide to the main features of the Canal de Rhone Asset. The entrance to the canal is in the eastern corner of the Tau Lagoon, and from water level, the towers of the cement works provide the best landmark. The canal begins in the middle of a noisy and unpleasant industrial area and for the first four kilometers there is little or no attraction for visitors. After an hour's cruising some old warehouses announce our arrival in Frontignan. The surrounding area is noted for its fine muscat wines and the port has served the wine industry for hundreds of years. Although moorings are provided at the main quay, the close proximity of the main railway line makes for some very noisy surroundings. However, you may be forced to stay here, as a low road bridge that crosses the canal at this point is only open to navigation at certain times of the day. Unlike the Canal de Midi, the Rona set does not have the benefit of plane trees planted along its banks, and for the next 20 kilometers, the shadeless canal crosses a series of saltwater lakes that provide an ideal habitat for flocks of flamingos.
For most of this section, the canal runs parallel with the coast, and the waters of the Mediterranean are never more than a few hundred meters away. At Le Quatre Cano, the canals arrive at the junction with the river Les. Turning right into the river leads to the port of Palaval La Flo, while upstream lies the city of Montpellier, although the river is only navigable for six kilometers as far as Port Ariane, a new marina development on the outskirts of Lat. The port is also home to higher company locoboat plaisance. Back at the junction, the large gantry mechanism with its bright blue gates enables the canal to be sealed off when the river is in flood. Palaval Le Flow offers full marine services and the opportunity for smaller craft to enter the Med. The town is a major sailing center that relies heavily on tourism for its economic viability and during the summer the beaches, seen here out of season, are packed with holiday makers and the population can often swell to three times its normal size. The resort boasts a large number of quayside restaurants, together with a casino and several nightclubs. The canal continues to cut its way through the shallow Etongs and soon arrives at Le Cabane de Perrault, an area of old fishing huts that marks our arrival at the sailing resort of Carnan. The resort has a long sandy beach, while across the bay lies the ultra-modern skyline of one of the largest marinas on the French Mediterranean. La Grande Motte is a huge purpose-built development that was designed by the architect Jean Balladur. Originally the site was just a large area of scrubland set between the sea and the lagoons until a plan to restructure the coastline transformed it into a vibrant year-round resort. La Grande Motte is situated two kilometers to the south of the canal but it's well worth making the effort to visit this visually stimulating complex. The canal now swings inland for 10 kilometers and arrives at the gateway to the Camargue, the ancient wall town of Aigues-Mortes. Visitor moorings with water and electricity points can be found at the far end of the Port de Plaisance, right alongside the town walls. Access to the old port and the way ahead is via a swing bridge, although there is a longer alternative route that bypasses this obstacle. The 30 meter high Constance Tower dominates the landscape for miles around. The building was originally designed as the town keep, but for several centuries was used to house political prisoners and religious detractors. The tower is open to the public and there are fine views over the pantile rooftops and the surrounding area. Aigues means dead waters and gets its name from the salt marshes that once encircled the town. Today the area is a magnet for tourists and during the summer months the narrow streets are crammed with visitors. The central square with its many open air restaurants is named after Saint Louis who founded the town in 1240 as a staging post for the Holy Crusades. During that time, Aigues was a busy seaport, but due to severe silting, it now lies six kilometers inland and is connected to the Mediterranean by the Canal Maritime that runs down to the coast through an area of salt lagoons. 
The Canal Maritime, which is only suitable for boats with a draft of less than 1.3 metres, enters the sea at Le Gros de Roir. Higher craft are not allowed to enter the commercial harbour and must moor in the Port de Plaisance. This busy fishing port is also a popular tourist resort that offers a fine selection of seafood restaurants overlooking the quaysides, together with a long sandy beach. After leaving Aigues Mort, the Canal de Rona Set enters the marshlands of the Petite Camargue. And although the landscape is flat and rather uninspiring, the area is an internationally renowned natural habitat for wildlife and fauna. For the next 20 kilometers, the canal cuts its way through an area of isolated etangs, which are home to over 140 species of birds, including egrets, heron, duck and oyster catchers. Apart from the hamlet of Galician that offers basic services, waterside facilities along this remote section are practically non-existent until the canal arrives at Saint-Gilles. Craft wishing to enter the Petite Rhone do so at Saint-Gilles Lock, which is situated along a side arm of the canal three kilometers before the town. The huge lock measures 195 meters by 12, and here smaller craft with a draft of less than 0.7 meters can head downstream to the heart of the Camargue, although care is needed when navigating the shoals on the lower stretches of the river. Turning left out of the lock takes you upstream to the town of Arles and the River Rhone. Arles is the capital town of the Camargue and one of the prettiest in Provence. Its origins date back to 46 BC when Julius Caesar founded a colony on the banks of the River Rhone. The narrow lanes and alleyways are best explored on foot and the town boasts a wealth of Roman remains. This large amphitheatre dates back to the first century AD and was used to stage gladiator fights in front of audiences of up to 20,000 people. Today, the arena is used for bullfights. Other sites worth visiting include the Roman circus and baths, together with the ruins of the outdoor theatre that was regularly used for plays and mimes. From the 5th century on, the site was occupied by houses and religious buildings that were later removed to reveal a semicircular orchestra section together with a marble pavement. Several open-air concerts are held in the amphitheatre during the summer months. Just a few metres away in the Place de Republic stand two churches of very differing appearance. The plain, late Gothic-style facade of St Anne's Church is somewhat overshadowed by the elaborate Romanesque architecture of the 12th century Church of saint Trophime. One of Arles' most famous inhabitants was Vincent van Gogh, who moved to the town in 1888 and over the next 14 months produced more than 200 paintings in what many believe to be his most prolific period and today his influence can still be seen in local shops and galleries. Back on the Canal de Rona set we now arrive at Saint-Gilles, named after a hermit who settled here in the 8th century. The refurbished quayside offers pleasant moorings and is a mishmash of residential craft and short-term visitors. At the far end of the quay is the higher base of Crown Blue Line. The town offers all the main services in this otherwise remote area and several restaurants can be found in the tree-lined streets. For those wishing to explore deeper into the heart of the Camargue, the local tourist office can arrange horse riding expeditions and jeep safaris.
The Abbey of Saint-Gilles, built in the 11th and 12th centuries, boasts fine examples of Provençal sculpture dating back to medieval times. The ornate west front features carvings depicting the life of Christ. The church also houses a large crypt containing the remains of Saint-Gilles, together with a unique spiral staircase. After leaving Saint-Gilles, we once again enter the remote marshlands of the Camargue and continue on the final leg towards Beaucaire. The canal passes to the south of the town of Belgarde that offers all the basic services and then arrives at Nourigueur Lock, just six kilometers from the outskirts of Beaucaire. The locking sequence is completely automatic and is started by pushing a button in the unmanned control cabin. 97 kilometers after leaving the port of Set, the canal arrives at its eastern terminus in the town of Beaucaire. The port de Plaisance lies right in the heart of the town and offers pleasant if somewhat noisy moorings. As far back as the Middle Ages, Beaucaire was known for its huge fair, with traders travelling from all over Europe and the Mediterranean to buy and sell their wares. And today the local market still proves popular with visiting boat crews. Parts of the old town have been swallowed up by more modern developments but many of the medieval buildings can still be seen in the narrow streets and alleyways. Standing guard above the rooftops is the old castle, surrounded by an 11th century wall. The triangular keep offers fine views over the town and across the River Rhone to Tarasson. Pleasant walkways have been built on top of the ramparts that surround the old quarter and these broad pavements eventually lead the visitor back to the port. Unfortunately, this basin and Beaucaire Lock marks the end of the waterway, as there is no longer any access to the River Rhone. Craft wishing to enter the river and travel northwards through central France must do so via Saint-Gilles Lock and the Petite Rhone. The Canal du Midi and the Canal de Rhone Set offer superb cruising for all to enjoy. And thanks to the vision of men like Pierre Paul Riquet, the waterways of southern France will continue to delight and astound for many years to come. Music